Historic Milwaukee's YouTube channel too. Um, so my name is Grace Fear. I'm the events director for Historic Milwaukee. Thank you for joining us on this lovely summer evening. There's probably lots of dragonflies and ladybugs enjoying the evening outside as well. Um, we are excited that we have this really cool pop-up shop within our store on the corner of Michigan and Broadway. So if you haven't been in the shop lately, stop by. Um, featuring lots of cool little merch inspired by ladybugs and dragonflies. And um, part of the idea behind that was the building that's on Water Street around the corner from us that has huge, the huge ladybug installation that I'm sure most people are familiar with by now. Um, I'm also, my, my father's side of my family is German and my aunt always collected ladybugs, which are a sign of good luck in German culture. Um, so I'm, I'm a big fan of the ladybug icon. Um, but when we sent out the email about this really cool pop-up shop, Tim Vargo reached out to us, who's our presenter tonight, who also went through guide training with Historic Milwaukee and has volunteered with us throughout the years, had an idea of doing a program with us, which we think is just so cool. Um, so Tim, in addition to being a history lover and um, supporter of Historic Milwaukee, is the manager of research and community science at the Urban Ecology Center, and they are another great partner of ours, and they open up a lot of their locations for doors open, so if you haven't been to their sites or haven't been in a while, definitely stop back to those um, September 23rd and 24th as doors open. Um, and you can go there other times of year as well. So I'll let Tim take it from here. Fantastic. I'm seeing some some friends signing up here, uh, Chris and Donna and some other folks that have done some great programs uh, I, that have been on programs that have made them great. Um, and uh, I'm just super excited to be here. Um, and are we going to, is it like time to share now or the screen? Uh, yes, please, please go ahead and share. And I guess I should mention if anybody has questions, feel free to use the Q&A or the chat. Um, we might even see the chat more more quickly. So you can pop those in there throughout the presentation and we can either address them as we go or at the end. Fantastic. No. All right. Um, okay, well, uh, once again, good good Thursday evening. Uh, everyone, and I'm absolutely thrilled and honored to be here um, with Historic Milwaukee, Inc. As Grace mentioned, I'm a huge fan. I have a ton of respect for this organization and this community. Um, and again, when that subject of ladybugs and dragonflies came into my email from Historic Milwaukee, Inc. Uh, as part of this new pop-up for the store, I thought, you know, heck, I love to talk about ladybugs and dragonflies mainly from an ecological perspective, um, and a slice of that ecological understanding of any animal is its natural history. Uh, so I thought this would be kind of a fun mashup. Um, and I'm honored to spend the next bit of time with you uh, sharing the stories of ladies and dragons in Milwaukee. Uh, the artwork, artwork on the left is just a stock photo, uh, but the art on the right is part of the fantastic items for sale in the pop-up and I encourage you to check out their website and buy beautiful items for sale and just support HMI in general. Uh, I work at a place called the Urban Ecology Center um, that has three neighborhood branches in Milwaukee. Our mission is to connect people in cities to nature and to each other. Our vision is to inspire generations to build environmental curiosity, understanding and respect. We restore hope and heal our urban natural world, neighborhood by neighborhood, and we do this under a value framework of practicing kindness, nurturing communities of belonging, caring for nature, seeking knowledge, and inspiring learning, and most importantly, through finding fun and sharing it. Uh, we do that through core programs like neighborhood-based environmental education, community programming, land stewardship, neighborhood engagement, volunteer programs, eco-travel, and I'm part of the research and community science team. And our goal is to support collaborative spaces for urban research between professional and community scientists. We primarily study the wildlife of Milwaukee, uh, as well as the human dimensions of urban wildlife under an adaptive management framework to support wildlife conservation in Milwaukee. So there's several stories kind of wrapped up in this presentation. And I'll start with a story that happened early in my career. 
I had just moved back to Milwaukee after studying wildlife in Costa Rica, and I took a job at the Urban Ecology Center to study the wildlife of Milwaukee. And one of the first things I did was to meet with a professor at UWM. I'm not going to say their names out of courtesy, but I approached this professor about putting together a strong program in urban wildlife ecology at the Urban Ecology Center. And the response I got was underwhelming, uh, to say the least. They didn't completely discourage me from my ambitions, but essentially they said uh, something to the effect of, nah, I don't think you're going to get anywhere trying to study urban ecology. There's just not enough energy and excitement about urban ecosystems, which tend to be degraded and polluted. I don't think it's going to work. Um, if you want to study wildlife, go to a wild place. Uh, don't stay in the city. So I left the me meeting uh, feeling a lot of things, an obvious disappointment at first, uh, which then soon led to uh, in indignation, uh, which led me to you know essentially think, okay, I actually think you are completely wrong on this you professor with your fancy PhD, I think there is a role to study wildlife in cities like Milwaukee. And maybe at the end of the day, this meeting was a good thing because it essentially caused me to kind of double down on my efforts and prove this person wrong. But the reality it is, the reality is I didn't have to prove them wrong. Uh, the world ended up proving them wrong because in the ensuing couple of decades, the fields of urban ecology and urban wildlife have really taken off uh, as they should. They kind of grew out of nothing uh, to become one of the hottest areas of ecological research today. So take that professor who will not be named. Actually, this person is a really good friend and colleague that I admire and respect, but I'm just kind of happy that they were wrong about this. So the world has really focused on the importance of urban ecology, including Milwaukee. And so I set off to study the wildlife of Milwaukee. Um, and in doing so, I got to witness a pretty fantastic transformation uh, in the last 20 years. I've worked at the UEC for 21 years now. Um, and in that time, I've witnessed the return of important and iconic wildlife to Milwaukee. There are a lot of great stories out there about this transformation, uh, well, well told by historians like John Gerda uh, of Milwaukee's abuse and then subsequent healing of their natural areas. Um, you know, the Milwaukee River was once so foul they had to build a pumping station just to move that stench to the lake. Uh, there was even a proposal to put a park on top of the Milwaukee River downtown because it was so festered and, and polluted. And so if you put a park on top of it, it would just kind of get it out of sight, out of mind. The river would run underneath the city which would have been an ecological death knell. Um, I'm glad it didn't happen. And I'm glad there are so many fantastic organizations out there and individuals out there that recognize the value of the river as an asset to the city and all the great work that's been done. Uh, so it started with heavy duty cleanups, mitigation, invasive plant removal, erosion control, uh, rewilding and native plantings and uh, it once it started to build, they started to come back, not just from an economic perspective and people perspective and the river walk and all of the great outdoor restaurants and condominiums along the river. Um, but then the wildlife started coming back in 2004, uh, two years, I think, yeah, two years after I began studying the wildlife of Milwaukee, we had our first confirmed beaver sighting, uh, the first confirmed sighting in decades, probably four or five decades. So yay, high fives. Um, but then for the next three years, we didn't have anything. So it was pretty cool to have that one sighting. But then, you know, it wasn't until 2007 that we had another beaver sighting. Okay, that's two in a few years. Uh, and then uh, in 2008, we had a handful of sightings. And then lo and behold, these beavers are starting to actually do what beavers do, chop down trees um, and build dens along the riverbank. And now we have a a healthy population of beavers on the Milwaukee River and the Menominee Rivers. Uh, this is a photo from a Journal Sentinel article um, by Gerda uh, about the return of beavers to downtown Milwaukee. And just a little while ago, we got a, a call from uh, Here and Now, the, the NPR show. And they said, hey, we've been hearing about the beavers returning to Milwaukee. Do you think we could go and look for one? 
And uh, we said, well, yeah, we can sure we can try to look for one. Chances are pretty, pretty low that we'll find one and we'd have to go out at dust by canoe. And we did. We we took the producer out in a canoe and sure enough, we we saw beavers. So they're they're pretty regular to find. We've got the evidence. Um, and that's a, a really, really important part of the ecosystem. After the beavers came the otters. Otter sightings are now are, are still sporadic. They're kind of like that early beaver. You know, you see one and then you wait a while and you see another. Um, hopefully the frequency will will continue to grow. Uh, this photo is an article from the Atlanta Journal Constitution about the return of the otter to downtown Milwaukee. And then you have the iconic bald eagle, almost never seen in Milwaukee uh, after the population collapse due to pesticides, DDT. But then again, over the last five or six years, eagle sightings at first were like, oh my God, we saw an eagle in Milwaukee. And then all of a sudden now it's becoming pretty regular. People are seeing them much more regularly and they're starting to nest here. So Milwaukee's even seen some fairly uncommon dwellers uh, of urban settings. An, an American badger at the post office a while back. We also caught a badger on one of our trail cam a few years later, or trail cams uh, a few years later. And some of the animals that are returning are, are much less maybe sexy, at least, you know, to most people. But the northern short-tailed shrew was a really big deal when we started to, to uh, see that again in in urban parks um coyotes skunks and deer are now so common we barely register them anymore turkeys are so common they're given names and facebook pages like the east side turkeys and the tosa turkeys and then who can forget the milwaukee lion uh, which was picked up by all the major national news sources and was the subject of a later animal planet show in which they brought in a tracker from malawi uh, in africa to milwaukee and he pretty much confirmed that, yes, a mountain lion did make its way through the city. All the, the police force, all of the, the media, um, it was likely a mountain lion. And you can actually watch this show now on YouTube. So Milwaukee has been mirroring uh, other urban areas around the world as efforts to green cities have led to the return of wildlife to cities to the point where most animals have stories and relationships with places like Milwaukee. And we're here today to focus on two particular groups of animals, ladybugs and beetles. Um, and uh, my personal life story has involved two fairly strong interests that have bordered on obsession. Um, for many years, I was obsessed with birds. I wanted to see all the birds. I wanted to count all the birds. I kept lists of how many birds I saw in my yard and in the city, in the county, Wisconsin, the world. Anytime I traveled, I did some research about what kind of new birds I could add to my lists. And I always brought my binoculars and anytime I had some downtime, I looked for them. Uh, this obsession thankfully went away and uh, don't get me wrong, I still like looking at birds, but I look at birds now as part of nature and I'm really interested more in the, in the whole. Um, but then another more recent obsession had to do with history, with more the human dimensions of history. So. That was a period where I just tore through all of the Milwaukee history books, the, the history of neighborhoods of, of Milwaukee. And um, and then during this phase, border, bordering on obsession, um, anytime I traveled to a new place, I, I poured over the local history of that place. And I think this obsession is also over, but um, I like the place that both of these led me. So now anytime I'm out and about, and we're looking at Three Bridges Park here, um, I, I'm really trying to focus on and read the landscape because studying nature and studying human history have a lot in common. Um, you know, John Goethe said something to the effect of everything you see around you is the result of history. Uh, and, and even though we tend to, to separate humans from nature, the reality is uh, humans are just really unique animals that have done a lot of engineering to the landscape, like the beavers. Um, and ecologists study landscape patterns, historians study landscape patterns. And I really love to study that intersection between the natural and human histories. Um, so starting with the natural history of ladybugs and dragonflies, and, and by necessity, I do need to tell you that this is a really abbreviated uh, natural history since there's just hours and hours 
of stories to tell from each group. Um, and for as long as humans have been around, we have had a, a strong desire to make sense of the natural world, uh, part out of interest, part out of survival, uh, to bring order to the natural world. And part of that is to, to classify life. Um, and so e even studies show that newborn babies, one of the first things that they can start to understand are to, to tell the difference between things that are alive and things that are, aren't, are, that aren't alive. Um, and uh, I mean, there's, there's fascinating research that if, if some part of the brain is damaged, uh, some people cannot, can no longer the, tell the difference between things that are alive. Um, and so it's, it's, it's a, a strong part of our brain. It's, it's really ingrained. Um, and we are inherently good at organizing living things. So um, for so many people, myself included, that grew up with pets, uh, you know, what was your first word? I, there's an abundance of people that their first word was dog. Um, and somehow, even at an early age, humans can tell that all of these things that look quite different are all dogs. So we're really good at kind of, kind of already grouping things. Many cultures and people throughout time and across the globe have had various ways to understand and classify the natural world, um, the natural systems. And in the Western world, the winner was the Swedish scientist, uh, Carl Linnaeus, who came up with a classification system that many of us learned about in traditional Western schools. Uh, so he ordered life into categories and subcategories. And, you know, we all had to memorize the kingdoms, phyla, class, order, family, genus, genus species. Um, this is a useful system. It's not the only system by any stretch of the imagination, but it is a useful system that many people have spent a lot of time on. It has advantages and disadvantages. Um, one of the disadvantages really to do with technology. So in the systems, we kind of just group things together because they had similar characteristics. Um, and if they had different characteristics, they were often grouped separately. And the big problem with that is that looks can be deceiving. So here are two birds. These two birds were given different names, grouped as separate species, each put in their neat little box um, until, oh, wait a second. These two birds are building a nest and raising a family together. They are the same species. The term for this is sexual dimorphism, where males and females look quite different. And it's evident in many groups of animals. Uh, and that was one of the problems with the early classification system. Even young and old animals of the same species can look very different. Uh, on the flip side, species can look very similar to each other and are thought to be closely related. So they're grouped next to each other in the tree of life. But there's this process called convergent evolution where two unrelated species are under similar selection pressure, a similar environment. And so they evolve similar adaptations and look like each other, even though they're unrelated. Um, and then an another problem with this grouping of life is that according to the system, you may have heard this recently, there is no such thing as a fish. Fish do not exist uh, according to the system. Look it up. Um, but now we have modern genetic research that can help us look at the evolutionary history of life. Um, they can help us to modernize phy phylogeny, uh, which is slowly taking us away from the Linnaeus system that we all learned about in school. Maybe our grandkids won't have to memorize this system, um, and it's going to probably go to something new. It still holds up, and it's still a good way to tell the natural history, particularly of dragonflies and ladybugs. So to begin with, dragonflies and ladybugs are considered animals. And this separates them from things like plants uh, and fun fungi and bacteria. And believe it or not, all of these things pictured here are considered animals, including my favorite, all-time favorite animal, the tardigrade, or the water bear on the upper left, uh, which lives in moss jungles and can survive in space. Uh, animals are characterized, among other things, as being multicellular. And with a few exceptions, they eat. They breathe oxygen and they move around. Then the next group down um, in the dragonfly and ladybug chain is the phylum. 
So they are arthropods, which are invertebrates. They don't have a background bone. They do have an exoskeleton, a segmented body, and paired jointed appendages for the most part. Um, to get bigger, arthropods have to molt, which means shedding their exoskeleton to reveal a new one. Here are some examples of arthropods ranging from spiders to barnacles to tiny microscopic parasitic shrimp to a 10 foot long sea scorpion that has unfortunately been extinct for quite a while, or maybe fortunately. And the next step to get to ladies and dragonflies is to move to class, kingdom phylum class, and they belong to the class insecta, hexapods, meaning they have six legs for the most part, uh, three pairs of jointed legs, three body parts that are easy to remember. Um, if you've ever heard that classic kid song, head, thorax, abdomen, uh, they have compound eyes, pair of antennae, an open circulatory system, and we they represent half of all known living named organisms. And it's likely that over 90% of all life forms, different species uh, on earth might be uh, insects of the animals. So um, ranging from the giant atlas moth to the microscopic fairy fly. And at this point, we need to take two different paths because in the next grouping, ladybugs and dragonflies are now diverging into different groups. So the grouping that they diverge is order, and if you like etymology and Latin and Greek roots to words, this starts to get fun. Uh, most orders of insects, if they have wings, have the root, root word patera, terra. P is silent, but it's fun to say. Um, so that means wing in Greek. So for example, the pterodactyl uh, is named for winged fingers. Tero is wing, dactyl is finger. And a lot of the insect orders have this word terra in them, at, mainly at the end. So for example, butterflies, moths, and skippers are in the lepidoptera, and that means scaly wing. So this is the magnified scales on the wings of a monarch butterfly. Uh, grasshoppers are in the order orthoptera. Oops, sorry. Uh, don't have slippers. Grasshoppers are orthoptera, and ortho means straight wing. And flies and mosquitoes are in the order Diptera, which means two wings, so di and terra, because um, they've lost the second pair of wings that many insects have. So um, our group is the Odonata. They don't have terra in their name, but Odonata is Greek for tooth uh, because their mouth parts have tooths and teeth. <laughs> uh, and I can attest to this because I've been bitten by one um, and it, it did sting a bit, um, maybe more so to my pride. They're not actually teeth, but it, it hurts just the same. Um, and so the odonates include dragonflies and damselflies. And usually the best way to tell the two groups apart is that dragonflies tend to be larger and thicker and beefier. They're strong flyers. Um, their eyes come together at the top. And when they rest their wings, they're usually held out to the sides. Then you have damselflies, which tend to be more slender and delicate. They're slightly weaker flyers. Uh, their eyes are separated, and at rest, they hold their wings together behind their back. So somebody was really into folklore when they were naming these insects, uh, starting with dragons and damsels. Another proposed name for this group was the warrior flies. And the fun continues when you look at the names of individual species of these groups. The damselfly on the right is called the beautiful demoiselle. All odonates, damselflies, and dragonflies have aquatic larvae. They are all carnivorous, both as larvae and as adults. Uh, it's an ancient group. They were around and hanging out with dinosaurs in the Triassic. Uh, you may recognize this. It's from the dinosaur exhibit at the Milwaukee Public Museum. Um, and you can see an ancient giant dragonfly perched on a giant lycopod. It was before the trees were around. There isn't one family of dragonflies, but they belong to an order, or actually it's an infra, infra order called Anisoptera, uh, which means unequal wing. Because if you look closely, the hind wing, the wings on the bottom are slightly broader than the forewings. 
and so they're uh, an isoptera, meaning unequal. And if you're wondering if because there's an anisoptera, is there an isoptera? And the answer is yes. The flying termites are belong to the isoptera because their wings are equal. Um, there's a whole lot to say about dragonflies. There are excellent resources out there. There are books, there are field guides. Um, a couple of things to note. They are excellent predators, both as flying adults and swimming larvae. In fact, uh, dragonfly larvae are really a top predator um, in the benthic world of rivers and streams. They're considered kind of the lion, the savanna, a lion of the savanna. Um, they're the eagle, they're the grizzly bear. So if you're hanging out and you're small and you're on the bottom of a stream, um, these are the ones you have nightmares about, those aquatic larvae. Um, they have lightning fast reflexes. They are designed to capture prey, both adults and young. Um, they have a mouth part that shoots out. Again, this is the stuff of nightmares and, and horror movies. If you're a, you know, a, a, any kind of animal living in the bottom of a stream, um, they usually eat other insects, but they have been known to eat other animals, um, in, including fish. They are fantastically, amazingly dexterous flyers. Um, they can turn on a dime and literally land on a pinpoint. And if you think of all the groups that have true flight, so um, over time, there's been four groups that have evolved to fly separately. Uh, the insects, the birds, um, the bats, and then the extinct uh, group of, of pterosaurs. And of, of the three groups that are around currently, um, if you think about their efficiency as flight, which are the best flyers, um, the 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 bats are probably the relatively they're they're poorer flyers than the other groups. They've only been flying for you know a, a smaller number of millions of years. Uh, birds have been flying you know longer than bats, so they've got it down pretty well. But the insects have been flying pretty much forever, and they're so good at it. And and you know. Biomimicry is a thing. A lot of engineers, a lot of human engineers um, are trying to figure out how to improve flight. And so they study all these animals. Um, but the amount of control it takes for this dragonfly um, to do what it does and seemingly effortlessly um, and to grab moving prey and to figure out where it's going to go. And if the prey ducks, it can duck too and dodge. And, and uh, it's pretty incredible. So as predators, dragonflies, both adults and larvae, are, are pretty amazing. So we move from the dragonflies now to the ladybugs. Ladybugs are a type of beetle, um, which is the most diverse group of insects, which are the most diverse group of animals. And beetles belong to the group Coleoptera, and Coleoptera means sheathed wing. Uh, so in beetles, the forewing, a lot of the flying insects have two pairs of wings, a, a, a pair of forewings and a pair of hindwings. Um, so in the, in the flies, they lost that pair of wings. Some, in, some groups have lost wings altogether, um, and the wings have taken different shapes. The, the coleopters still have that two pair of wings formula, but um, what happened with them is that that forewing turned into this protective sheath. And, it, and so it protects the body and it protects the, the flying wings, which are underneath it. Um, so we can't see the flying wings. This is a, a, a scarab beetle. We can't see the flying wings because they're protected from the four, the, what are evolved to four wings, uh, the elytra. And to see the protective or to see the, the flying wing, they have to get that non-flying elytra out of the way and then the flying wings can kind of spread out underneath um, and uh, so the, the elytra kind of get out of the way. This is a very successful body plan for protection. The downside to this is that beetles and I'm sorry are just not the best flyers. Um, 
They can usually get from point A to point B, but if something gets in their way, they're probably not gonna fly around it. They're, they'll just bump right into it. Uh, I personally have been bumped into by many a beetle, you know, but they're polite. They'll say, they're, they'll say I'm sorry, as they kind of fall to the ground and then have to like take off again. So they're, they're the opposite end of the dragonfly, which is an amazing flyer. These, they can do it if they need to. They're kind of like turkeys. Turkeys can fly if they need to, but boy, they're gonna be tired. Um, and personally, I think this body design leads to some really cool photos and, and maybe the beetle version of the, the Marvel superheroes. So this is a rhinoceros beetle just before it taking flight. Um, so the, the elytra moving out of the way and then the delicate folded flight wings uh, come out from underneath. The ladybug is a colloquial name for a group of beetles belonging to the order Coccinellidae. In Britain, they're commonly known as ladybirds. And among entomologists, they're often referred to as ladybird beetles. The lady in question refers to a fairly well-known human in history, the mother Mary. Um, so this is uh, the lady's beetle. And um, the, the bug part of, there, there's more to this too, the, the, the fact that the, she's, they're wearing red, the dots represent, um, you know, uh, from terms of religious history, uh, that's another kind of rabbit hole that's fun to go into. The bug part of ladybug is a little more muddied. So colloquially, the term bug often refers to anything that's small and crawly and squishy. Um, I, I, squishy, people like to squish bugs. I don't personally, people do. Um, so if it's small and squishy, that's kind of what we call a bug. Uh, so even though snails, centipedes, spiders, roly polies, um, they're not related to, we kind of group these as bugs. So it's not a scientific term, it's a cultural term. Just like vegetables are not a, bot a botanical term, but they're a cultural term. Um, so among entomologists, there is an order of insects that is called the bug, the true bugs, and those are the, the hemiptera, so hemi meaning half, like hemisphere. Terra, of course, means wing. And in the hemiptera, the only the front part of the wing is, is that is sclerotized. Uh, so it gives it that appearance that the wing is cut in half. Um, and the back part of the wing is that kind of transparent, uh, delicate part. Uh, so because there's an order of bugs that are called the true bugs that most entomologists reserve the term ladybird beetle to minimize the confusion. But I mean, we all call them ladybugs. So if we describe dragonflies as dangerous and daring and damselflies as delicate, uh, we describe ladybugs as cute. Cute as the button that they resemble. And I, I did look up that term, cute as a button. Apparently cute as a button, I just assumed it meant uh, like the button on your shirt. There's actually a button flower that that term was named after. So. These are all are as cute as that button flower. Um, they, they have a body shape that anyone can recognize immediately, um, that outer dome. Uh, and just like a good true beetle, that outer dome protects the animal and it protects the wings. And so ladybugs also can fly. And it's really amazing when you think of how much of that wing is packed in there. Um, and National Geographic has done some, some studies as to how that outer wing can get in to such a small space and still be rigid enough to fly. And um, really, again, engineers are studying it. It's kind of a similar concept to if you have a, a measuring tape, uh, the, the kind that rolls in. Well, if you roll it out, it's it's hard enough to remain kind of rigid, except for when you you know, you've got, when you don't want it to, and then it collapses, but, but it, it can remain rigid and then also roll up in, you know, that protective sheath. Um, there is some of that tensile strength uh, that we're studying in the ladybug's wing, ladybug's wing, and it's a pretty incredible uh, folding job. 
uh, when you when you look at how all of that works, because it has to be strong enough to fly. It also has to be delicate enough to bring to to fold in um, under that that wing. Um, and then once in flight, they are beetles. They're awkward and clumsy. Uh, but the fact that they can fly at all is again pretty amazing with with all of this. Um, and as cute as the adults are, I'd have to say that the larval ladybugs are about as scary as the dragons. Um, like the dragonfly larvae, ladybug larvae are ferocious predators. And their favorite meal, which for, for many is a good thing, are aphids. Um, and so farmers, gardeners, welcome ladybugs because they are good at eating pests, agricultural pests. But these are eating and killing machines, which you don't always think of as ladybugs. So, you know, after they hatch and they're growing in these stages, um, they are a predator. The adult forms are also predators, but we're learning more and more that um, they, they're more omnivorous than we thought. So they're starting to consume a decent amount of plant material as well. And I don't know why they start to seem less cute when you see them um, as predators, but um, they're still cute. And as an urban dweller, uh, I have memories of ladybugs congregating in the windowsills over the winter, um, particularly in our bathroom. And this behavior is explained by the timing of their life cycle. So normally wild ladybugs uh, will find a protected area to hunker down for the winter. Any insect in Wisconsin has to figure out a plan for the winter. Um, some of them have just moved into our houses and have become part of our houses, um, and they just live here year round. Uh, but anything that's out in the wild has to figure out a way to live through the winter. Um, dragonflies will overwinter in the water, underwater, and they can stay there. Um, but a lot of insects will either overwinter as eggs or as larvae or as adults. And the ladybugs will overwinter as adults. So if our houses weren't here, they, once the weather started getting really cold, they'd go and find some protected places, um, you know, maybe under a log, maybe in crevices, the warmer, the better. Um, but the ladybugs in the vicinity of our house on the Southwest side of Milwaukee were attracted to the warmth of our house. And to their delight, they, they found out that our house was not completely sealed. Um, so they found their way in either through a permanent or temporary opening. And um, if this does happen to you, it's not really a big deal. Uh, probably the pest control folks will tell you it's a big deal. Um, uh, this is not my area of specialty, but from what I understand, they really, they don't do damage to your house. Um, you're, a, an infestation would be extremely rare, um, mainly because once it's spring, they need to get back outside. They want to be outside. That's where the food is. That's where their life happens. Um, and so they'll go and find a nice aphid colony often. Um, and they'll lay their eggs near that aphid colony. And then I can imagine those little aphids like, hmm, what is that little new orange sphere thing over there? It's a little scary, but right now it's not uh, hurting me. But then all of a sudden this voracious uh, ladybug dragon larvae will come out and eat them all up. Um, so like, you know, we're, we're learning so much about every group of animals, but particular insects are often, you know, grouped as not, not, not a lot of parental care. Um, but parental care isn't always in, in how we see it. So the fact that mom is taking the time to lay eggs near a good buffet um, for as soon as they hatch. And she lays a lot of eggs that are not fertile. So as soon as the fertile eggs do hatch, they can, they can, they have two food sources, either the aphids or the non-fertile eggs that they can eat. Um, but that's, that's where they're, that's where they're going to go. And that's why they're proud. They're not going to stay in your house. They want to get outside and, and be what ladybugs are. Um, uh, and then the giant dragonflies, of course, return to their native habitat. Um, on buildings in downtown Milwaukee. Again, so many amazing stories to tell about ladybugs and dragonflies. Um, barely scratching the surface here. If your interest is piqued at all, 
about urban wildlife, uh, I do encourage you to check out the Urban Ecology Center's Backyard Naturalist series. It's a free program that was born out of the pandemic um, when they told it wasn't safe, told us it wasn't safe for us to be together outside. We started a virtual program uh, where we can explore the amazing species and ecological processes going on right now in our backyards. It's every Friday morning at 9 a.m. Um, we might talk about you know, squirrels or raccoons. Uh, we might talk about soil. We, there's been a program on, on the smell of rain, why rain smells the way it does, and that has to do with bacteria. Uh, we, we often have really great speakers uh, from around the world, um, but two of our archived episodes that are available, um, and if you're interested in anything that I've been saying about these two groups, uh, there's, you can go to the Urban Ecology Center's YouTube channel. Um, there's Pete's, Pete's Dragonfly is an episode and Lady Bird Beetle. Um, a lot more stories than I'm, I'm getting into today. Um, so if you're interested in this, again, this every Friday morning, no matter where you are, uh, you can go to our website or contact me for more information. I do feel the need to go through the naming process of both of these groups. So starting with dragonflies, the names of dragonflies are, in my opinion, as beautiful as they are. So you have the autumn meadowhawk. Uh, you have the Halloween pennant. We were just walking through Ware Nature Center and these, these guys were everywhere, beautiful. Uh, you have the dragon hunter. You have the harlequin darner, the splendid club tail, the bandweed and dragonlet, and the ebony bog hunter. Um, so again, the, the dragonflies are beautiful, uh, but their names are beautiful. And I think the same people that name dragonflies are the ones that name all these paint colors that we get at the store. And then you have this creativity um, also weaving its way over to the ladybug world. And the ladybugs have these just wonderfully creative names like the two-spotted ladybug or the two-spotted lady beetle, the four-spotted lady beetle, the five-spotted lady beetle, the six-spotted zigzag lady beetle, the seven-spotted lady beetle, wonderfully creative names, but there's more. The eight-spotted lady beetle, the nine-spotted lady beetle, the 10-spotted lady beetle, the 11-spotted lady beetle, the 12-spotted lady beetle. I have no idea where they got that name. Uh, the 13-spotted lady beetle, the 14-spotted lady beetle. Almost done. There's a few more you really want to Hear me out, there's the 15 spotted lady beetle, the 16 spotted lady beetle, the 18 spotted lady beetle. Here's my favorites, the 20 spotted lady beetle, the 22 spotted lady beetle, the 24 spotted lady beetle, the 26 spotted lady beetle. And if you're not already completely blown away, the 28 spotted lady beetle. So yeah, dragonflies and ladybugs just have some of the coolest, most creative names around. And as we wrap this program up, I'd like to make the connection back to Milwaukee to help, you know, to help lay the historical context for the presence of these two groups today. So downtown Milwaukee was built on a wetland, the uh, amazingly productive wetland surrounded by a cedar tamarack swamp. Um, that area would have supported an extremely diverse community of dragonflies. The surrounding uplands of Maple Beach and Oak Hickory would have supported a diverse community of ladybird beetles. Um, as European humans kind of rampaged through, uh, we did a pretty good job of, of reducing the populations of both through development, through pollution, the in introduction of invasive species, um, and we've done a pretty good number on the once healthy native populations of just about everything. But the pendulum is swinging back. We are really recognizing the value of conserving urban habitat, not only for wildlife, but for ourselves, because um, what's good for the wildlife is good for us. There are innumerable health benefits to being outside, benefits both to, to physical and mental health. There's social benefits, there's economic benefits to urban habitat conservation. 
And there are so many people and organizations throughout Milwaukee um, and beyond that are working hard to, to protect, to restore and create these urban green spaces. In fact, uh, dragonflies in particular are considered indicator species because many of these species, they, they, they live most of their life underwater and to live underwater, to breathe underwater, they need clean water to live throughout most of their, their life, their most of their larval stage. Um, when water gets polluted, dragonflies are some of the first to disappear. When waters get clean, they've shown over and over again that they can come back. And when they do, that's an indicator that the water is getting cleaner. And that's why it's really important to start paying attention and why I'm just so excited to see the return of some of the dragonfly species to Milwaukee's um, waters. It means that we've got clean water nearby and then we have a healthy enough terrestrial system to support the adults. My go-to for anything related to Milwaukee's dragonflies, bar none, is my colleague Maggie Steinhauer uh, at the Urban Ecology Center and the former vice president of the Wisconsin Odinate Society, which is another great resource. Um, so on the photo on the left, Maggie's actually leading a survey of snakes uh, at Three Bridges Park. There is a snake species in that is essentially Milwaukee snake species in Wisconsin. It's only found in the greater Milwaukee area, the Butler's garter snake. Um, so Maggie for uh, dragonflies, my go-to for anything beetle related is Heidi Meyer. Uh, she's a local community scientist uh, and she's seen here on a beetle hunt with another of my favorite local beetle experts, John Bales. Um, these individuals know maybe more than anyone about the local populations of these groups of insects. And the best way that I know of to learn more about them is to hang out with these wonderful humans. And you can too. Um, they both lead public walks that are free through the Urban Ecology Center, um, specifically related to dragonflies and beetles. Um, and as for dragonflies, uh, all those, I mean, and I just showed a few of the cool dragonflies all of those are here in Milwaukee, all of the great ones that I just showed. Um, you don't have to travel far to see them. Some of them are returning, some of them have been here. And Maggie's finding records of dragonflies that haven't been seen here in 80 years, uh, partly because she's looking, but partly because the habitat is, is getting healthier. Heidi, just last year alone, found five beetle species that have never been recorded in Wisconsin. Um, and uh, unfortunately, the lady, beetles are facing another crisis, which is the invasion of the exotic uh, Asian ladybird beetle. And that has displaced many native species, which again is another reason for us to, to really double down on our restoration efforts. But Heidi is also finding a lot of native ladybirds in Milwaukee's green spaces. And I just asked her for a list of some that she's found recently. Um, and she has found uh, in, in our green spaces downtown, the two-spotted lady beetle, the seven-spotted lady beetle, the 12-spotted lady beetle, the 14-spotted lady beetle. And just to prove that not all ladybugs are named according to the system, she also found the orange-spotted lady beetle and the twice-stabbed lady beetle and the Kansas lady beetle. So they're all here in Milwaukee. They were here in great numbers. They're returning. And we know this because we're paying attention and we're healing the land. I imagine each of you have relationships with these insects. Uh, I imagine we all have stories about our interactions with them, um, our feelings. They may involve awe, they may involve fear, uh, or both, um, or you know there may be indifference. Uh, you may remember the ladybugs on the buildings, um, or the recent history a few years ago when swarms of green darners were everywhere in people's yards in great numbers, and they made the news. And Sometimes there are just groups of insects that we're drawn to. We may cringe at the sight of a cockroach, but for whatever reason, we're totally okay letting a bug, uh, a ladybug, just crawl over our face, even though the cockroach can't bite you and the ladybug can. Um, so Milwaukee has a wealth of wildlife to complement the ladybugs and dragonflies and watching the wildlife return and understanding our wild neighbors has been my latest passion. And with that, I will end this program.
and stop sharing. And thank you for uh, spending this time. Thanks for having me, um, or for thank you for joining us. And I wanted to see if anybody had any questions. Um, in the meantime, I wanted to let you know that my five-year-old who's watching at home was distraught that she's never seen the majority of the lady beetles that you described of yeah, various, various colors. So we'll have to find <laughs> awesome. the, what is the 12 spotted one, I think was yellow um, that your colleague found locally. So I'll, yeah. we'll have to go searching. Yep. I guess, where would you recommend uh, a lady beetle hike? Um, I, it, it's, it's usually easier to find them in kind of grassland areas but you can find them anywhere. They'll be in trees. You just gotta like, the thing is, I think one thing I've learned from, from these people um, is, is it's less, less about like covering a great distance. Like maybe as a birder, you need to cover a great distance, but with a lot of these, it's just about really focusing on a small area. So like turning over the leaves, looking at the undersides of leaves, you know, turning over bark, uh, looking, in small places and you know we don't have some places if you do that and you get in all the nooks and crannies you got like venomous snakes and things to worry about we don't have that um so it's really about just finding a place looking at the cracks of the trees and then you start to see all the lichens and the beauty in them and so really focusing on small places is my my recommendation and then you start to see the stuff great and there's a lot of work to do uh, yeah, exactly. Many, many exploration days ahead of us. Are there any uh, perennials that you would recommend people plant to like foster healthy habitats for, I know, of course, we talk a lot about bumblebees um, and butterflies, but anybody for any, any plants for our, our ladybird beetles or our dragonflies? So usually I get this question in terms of birds and most people want to hear about birds and that's what I talk about more than anything. And so when I, when I focus on birds, I say, okay, here, the, the way that you can help birds the most really is to buy land, but most of us can't do that. So, um, you know, uh, there are other things you can do in terms of collisions and keeping your cats indoors, but probably, you know, a lot of people like to buy bird feeders. And what I recommend is, is to buy the, the natural bird feeders. So, so planting with native plants, there's, there's research that shows that even if you have a little postage stamp uh, backyard, uh, even if you just planted a portion of that small backyard with natives, um, the effect that it has on the local community is way bigger than you would expect. So it's not like we're bringing back like elk or bison and you need these huge tracts of land. Once you, what you're doing is you're supporting a stronger invertebrate community. Um, once you do that, then you really do help the birds. All birds at some point in their life feed insects to their babies, even hummingbirds. Um, so uh, the best bird feeders you can do, you can you know put in your yard or native plants. Um, or if you if you don't have a yard and you have you know patio, even just planting something on on the patio. Um, so I don't think there's a there probably is, and I don't know the answer. There's you know. Most people will put like hummingbird gardens or butterfly gardens. I don't know of anybody that's doing uh, ladybug gardens or dragonflies, be but anything that you do is good because both of those groups of insects are going to eat the little insects that you're attracting to your yard. Um, so it's a great question, um, but that's that's something that we can all do um, is uh, is get get native plants. So, and you don't have to mow and it helps with, you know, the, the pesticides and all that less work. Um, when I walk out to my front yard, I'm always seeing the most amazing insects and it's really fun. And it's a very small yard. Great question. Super. Uh, well, this has been really great. I've learned a lot. Um, I'm excited. We recorded the program, so we'll definitely have this up on our, our YouTube channel for others to watch as well. We thank you for joining us and we'll come in and visit you at the Urban Ecology Center soon. Fantastic. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. All right. Thanks. Take care, everybody.